Daniel Jackhor, is one of the most prolific, and successful artists the world has never heard of. Struggling to sell his own art, he soon finds his true genius, lies not in the creation of his own work, but in the forgery of the great masters that have come before him, artists like Picasso, Monet, Dagon Renoir. And with the help of a corrupt gallery owner in Boston, Massachusetts, Daniel soon learns the intricacies of the art world, as he becomes a true master himself, but his life is spiraling out of control, and his personal demons have brought him to the edge, where he hangs on by a thread, indebted to the mob for more than he can possibly pay back, Daniel gets roped into working for Seamus White, the head of the Irish family in New England, and an avid art collector, as Seamus's schemes become bolder and bolder, not only pushing the boundaries of Daniel's ability, but the limits of forgery itself, there is only one person who can track him down. And bring him home, his ex fiance who, as an authenticator, with the famed auction house, Sotheby's, discovers his fakes and the depths of trouble he's really in. Can she find him before the FBI does, or will his double crossing the mob, bring his world crashing down around him? And, more importantly, in the end, if no one knows, if they'll never know, is it really fake? Let's compare that, to an excerpt from Daniel Barbarizzi's book, Chasing the Thrill. The author and journalist Douglas Preston has written more than 30 novels and nonfiction works, many of them national bestsellers, several of them made into movies. Before he turned to writing full-time, he worked at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He'd grown up in Wellesley, Massachusetts, next door to the town where my wife Emily and I had just bought a home, so I felt a certain kinship there. Author, journalist, Massachusetts guy, he seemed like someone I could trust. Preston also happened to be a close personal friend of Forrest, getting to know Fenn after moving to New Mexico in the late 1980s. Preston found Fenn engaging, joining him in the celebrity-filled Santa Fe scene. I'd go to parties at his house, and there would be Suzanne Summers, there would be Murray Gell Mann, the Nobel laureate. There would be all these famous people. He collected them, and they liked him, because he's so damned interesting, Preston said. He also delighted in Fenn's mischievous side. Preston watched as Fenn did some elegantly questionable things to boost his art business, like finding undervalued artists, cornering the market on their work, and then hatching plans to pump up their value. He'd boost the stock in a very simple way, Preston said. He'd publish a beautiful, beautiful book about the artist, a gorgeous book, big production value. And then he'd start talking up the artist. And in fact, Forrest had a great eye, so he was able to see that these really were undervalued artists. He made so much money. Or the time when he came across a warehouse of paintings by the famed art forger Elmer de Horry. Most art dealers were repulsed by de Horry's actions and his work. Fenn went the other way, partnering up with John Connolly, the former governor of Texas, also incidentally, one of the people shot and wounded by Lee Harvey Oswald during the Kennedy assassination, to profit from de Horry's work. He and John Connolly bought an entire warehouse full of Elmer de Horry's fakes, and they sold them as fakes, Preston said, Famous fakes, the famous Elmer Dory, and they made a fucking fortune. Everyone wanted one of those fakes. I've got one of those fakes that they gave to me, a beautiful Matisse, ink drawing. It's so smart. He's so smart, Preston Marvel. Let's read a page from Forrest's book. Too far to walk, I'm not good on camera. That's why I asked an interviewer from CBS News, to let me have a beforehand look at the list of questions, she intended to ask me during an interview, I just wanted to think things over, for a minute, because it wasn't preordained that I would survive going on live network television, where King's X, and Oops, don't work very well, she was interested in me because John Connolly, the former governor of Texas and I, had purchased 100 oil paintings by Elmer de Horry, the great forger of French Impressionist paintings, Orson Welles made an hour-long documentary on the subject, and Clifford Irving wrote the book, Fake, about Elmer, who famously said, all of the great museums in America had his art, and didn't know it. He forged more than 1,000 paintings.
So, the question for the search community is this, how did the auction website, know about Daniel Barbarizzi's forthcoming book, Chasing the Thrill, in early 2020, if Daniel claims that he had to flag part of the Medium article? On September 23rd of 2020, in order to get a hold of Jack, whoever posted the movie Fake, on the auction website on April 22nd, of 2020, knew about Daniel Barbarizzi's, fake book that was to come out. Let's hear Daniel Barbarisi describe this event in his own words. On September 23rd, just over two weeks after Fenn died, a post surfaced on the website Medium, a self-publishing platform that allows users to distribute essays and other written works anonymously if they choose. Entitled, A Remembrance of Forrest Fenn, it was written by The Finder, who described himself thusly. The author is The Finder, and owner of the Forest Fen treasure. In 3,000 well-crafted words, the finder penned an ode to Fen, whom he described as his friend. I am the person who found Forrest's famed treasure, he wrote. The moment it happened was not the triumphant Hollywood ending some surely envisioned. It just felt like I had just survived something and was fortunate to come out the other end. In his essay, the finder revealed a great deal about the circumstances under which he had found the treasure but crucially, he would not divulge exactly where he had located it and said he did not plan to. He was also careful not to let any details about his own identity slip, indicating only that he was a millennial and had student loans to pay off. Beyond that, he was an enigma. So, I contacted him. Medium doesn't generally allow readers to contact the author of a piece directly, which is one reason it's good for anonymous posting. It does allow users to post public comments on a piece, and more than 100 people quickly had— most of them supportive, some of them skeptical, a few of them angry and aggressive. But I wasn't going to just post my email in the comments where anyone could read it. That left me no guarantee that the person I might end up in contact with would be the finder. I had one trick up my sleeve, though. There's a little-known way to send a direct message to the author of a medium piece. You have to flag a section of text indicating that it contains an error or a typo. That notifies the author of the piece that something needs to be corrected in his or her work. The system doesn't give you a lot of space, just enough to describe the problem. So I flagged a section of the essay, barely squeezed in who I was and how to contact me via email, and hoped for the best. I had no guarantee that the finder would look at the message or that he would understand exactly why he should get in touch, but it was worth a shot. Less than a day later, an email popped into my inbox. It was from an address whose name referred to Fenn's treasure. The finder had replied. He'd heard of my project, he said, and he might be willing to talk to me. But he insisted that we'd have to keep things off the record for now. And so began a month of back-and-forth correspondence, sometimes several emails a day. I soon had absolutely no doubt that the finder was legitimate. We discussed things other than the treasure, sometimes talking baseball. He was interested in why I voted the way I did on my Hall of Fame ballot and not a fan of my leaving off Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens. Or, after he'd read my last book, Gambling. That led things in an unexpected direction when he realized that Beep's friend, Mike McDonald, who had put out the $10,000 bounty for proof of the existence of the chest, was a minor character in my last book, and hence that I knew him. The finder, who seemed to have a mind for numbers and betting and an interest in poker, asked me if I would put him in touch with McDonald, serving as a go-between of sorts so the finder could claim the bounty. I agreed, but McDonald wouldn't accept the find as legitimate if the finder wouldn't reveal his identity, and with the finder unwilling to do that at the time, the discussions fizzled. For me, all of this was fascinating stuff, and I was glad the finder seemed to trust me. But it all got me only so far. I still had no idea who the finder was, and he still hadn't agreed to an actual interview. Two months after our initial correspondence, though, all that changed. After a lull in our ongoing conversation, an email from the finder appeared in my inbox. The lawsuit against me took a weird turn, he wrote. Looks like you'll have my name within a week. Fenn had been dealing with lawsuits before the chest was found, but they hadn't gone anywhere. After the chest was located, though, another lawsuit had dropped, this one leveled against both Fenn and the unknown finder as defendant. This was the suit brought by Chicago lawyer Barbara Anderson, claiming that the finder had stolen Anderson's saw via text and email hacking and used it to find the chest, despite her belief that the chest was in New Mexico and his contention that he located it in Wyoming. To this point, I hadn't given the lawsuits much thought. I read them, and though I am most certainly not a lawyer, I showed them to one. Neither of us expected much to come of them. 
Clearly, I should have paid them a little more attention, because this suit was likely about to answer one of the major outstanding questions about the chase. While the lawsuit seemed likely to be dismissed eventually, the Anderson suit had at least progressed to the point where the finder's name would be revealed. The finder seemed resigned to that fate. So even as he remained guarded about the solve and the location of the treasure, he now didn't mind telling me his true identity. And that's when I learned that a 32-year-old Michigan native and medical student was the person who had finally solved Fenn's poem. His name was Jack Stoof. It's obvious what the implied connections are. Daniel Barbarizzi's book is a fake cover story. The chest according to the auction site was laundered on May 13, 2020. The entire Jack story is a staged sham. Jack is the face of a cover-up. The account as told in Daniel Barbarizzi's book is a complete fabrication. Comparing the pictures from the McCracken lawsuit to what is described in Daniel's book shows glaring discrepancies. The chest is not full of water and the Ziploc bags are not brimming with water, not to mention there is no bracelet in the chest. The ending is a hoax.